Oh, I don't know. I'm asking you. <laughs> um, I hadn't counted on it. Okay. Do we, do we normally do that or? I don't know. It just depends. Um, when I've done in the past, we've only done it if like there are people that really want to be at the meeting, they can't make it, um, and uh -huh. for some reason want to watch it later. Okay. Well, I just pushed a button that said record, so okay. we might be, and. I think it looks like it's recording. So we okay. are on a 40 minute. So you must be on a free. Uh, right. That's the first thing I was going to say is that we might only have 40 minutes. <clears throat> and I think Nathaniel was going to take notes and I don't see him. So I will at least start. Okay. And I started putting an outline actually at the bottom of the notes page. Okay. Um, just because I was trying to think of how to facilitate this. Yeah. So I just started. So then I just put the notes page link in the chat if you okay. find it. Because um, I started to compile what was in the forum and then um, kind of putting it in one place. And so I emailed you about, uh, Steve, about possibly setting up collections. Right. Um, yeah, I saw that. Places where people can, because at least when I was doing the forum, I could only attach one thing and I was trying to attach multiples and it would work. Yeah. Um, okay. So, that could be a place where people just collect stuff. Yeah, okay. Hi, Nathaniel. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, are you gonna take our notes today? Is that is that right? I am happy to take notes today. Let me just get set up for it. Okay. Yeah, I just put the um, link in the chat again, because every time a new person comes in, I don't think the chat shows up. Okay. And then the only thing I was going to say about that was that we're apparently supposed to keep track of who participates. So if you could yeah. stick in your notes who's attending today. Yeah, so we'll Daniel, I've started putting notes at the bottom of the notes page. I already put a spot where, um, so I'm going to delete whoever. You said same Google Doc? Yeah, the same Google Doc. So if you scroll to the bottom, it says September 27, 2019. Um, I just put my name in there for facilitator. I'm hoping that you guys can mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. It's just taking a second to come up. Um, okay. Other, yeah, other than that, I was just going to remind people that uh, because I'm using a free Zoom account, we only have like 40 minutes. And so I'm just going to turn it over to Caitlin because she has way more experience than I do. And, uh, um, really argue. <laughs> <laughs> but, All right, I'm uh, ready to go whenever you guys are too. Okay. From my um, in the future, Steve, if you need this, if you want this to be an hour, I have a Zoom account that's that lets you do more. Yeah, I already asked Deb to set up. Okay, one. I was to say, Cube should be able to set you up with one, yeah. but um, I have one through a grant. So, um, so yeah, I sent out an email uh, or prompt last minute, um, thinking about just getting started with um, NetLogo learning materials. And I know um, a number of people have already responded. Wandi put a bunch of stuff out, and then Rachel and Vitor. And um, I just started to add things. And so I felt like when I was talking to Steve about how to frame this, um, I felt like we we're all kind of teaching different classes and have different goals. And so it might be good to kind of get an idea of what kind of resources we want to collect and annotate because we've got a quite a variety of resources um, already listed. And so I was curious of how we might think about creating a useful list for other faculty to come by and say like, like I, I can imagine like almost like a posting on cubes of like, here are a bunch of different resources if you're interested in getting started with teaching with NetLogo. Um, here are a couple different courses in which people have used different resources and how they approach getting students learning with it. And so um, I wanted to go around and, with everyone and just ask, uh, what is your hope that, like, how much familiarity do you want them to have with NetLogo and with agent-based modeling? Are they going to be doing this a lot in their classes? Are they doing it just as a one-off? Because um, I think that will inform kind of what kinds of materials or tutorials we're looking for. Let's just start. <laughs> uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, in our textbook, we start out with this chapter that's just a very basic introduction, but it's 
um, it was designed, uh, you know, as a in, as the an early chapter in the book where we go on to um, really push people through quite a bit of net logo and modeling. So um, uh, it still might serve as a useful introduction, even if people are going to do um, less than that. You know, if you're just trying to set up a couple of uh, exercises or something. But, yeah, I mean, I've provided the first couple chapters. That's it for my students. Let me do it because I'm not going into a whole course on it. We do have a whole course on it um, in the math department. I think that gets offered every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, they were like, "You use this for parasites?" Like it was pretty funny in discussion <laughs> about things. Um, so like, you yeah, say when you say, uh, "Sorry." No, go ahead. Um, so you, when you said you uh, use it, you mean just. Uh, Net logo, or are you talking more generally about a uh, uh, education based modeling? That's a good question. I lump them together because I use them at the same time. <laughs> and that's really the only time I use um, agent based modeling. In my parasitology class, they, they go through a scaffolding series of we have flip Fridays. So Fridays are exploration days and workshop days. And so the, one of the first ones is like, what is a model? And they don't, you know, getting them thinking about the differences between mathematical and physical models. And then I have them actually go through classic biological models and present on them and why we use them and why modeling is important and why math is important in biology. Because um, a lot of our students will come in with a high degree of math anxiety. And in the end of the course, they're coding and they're creating a parasite system in NetLogo. And so I use them kind of interchangeably, not interchangeably, but I don't ever really talk about agent-based bodily without doing it with NetLogo, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, other people, I tend to use things just a little bit, so I'm curious of what everyone else says. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, say that for, for me, I'm, I'm actually not putting in using that logo per se. Um, so right now I teach agent modeling, agent-based modeling as part of a course called Practical Computing for Scientists where <clears throat> um, we, I, I focus on three different plat, uh, com, uh, uh, computing platforms. So we just learn like command line Unix, Python, and then SQL. And so within that context, like I'm always trying to teach applied examples. And one of the examples I use is I use agent-based modeling in Python to teach object-oriented programming. Um, and so along those lines, like, um, I'm interested in the net, in the net logo, uh, platform, but I'm not I'm probably looking to use it explicitly, but I'm really interesting to, interested to see the kinds of questions that people are applying and teaching in agent based modeling. Right. So, uh, if, if there are good examples that I might be able to co-op, cause right now I, I have a couple of examples that I use and they're all right. Um, but it's not, um, exactly. What I want to do, and I'm trying to do the same sort of things in terms of like teaching them how these kinds of platforms and approaches and models are actually related to real systems. Really kind of so, appreciate it. So this semester, I have uh, two students. So one will be working with a net logo, but the other will work with the Python Mesa. Mesa. So Mesa is a version of a. Uh, net logo but in python environment so i want the students to work like simultaneously and then compare you know yeah, because one is she has no background about programming but the other is like a fluent in programming so they pick they pick what they prefer so i will ask them to you know work different yeah and Simul wandy what was, what, what was the name of that package uh, you said mesa, it was mesa? M -E -S -A. thank you yeah, so I think the degree of coding that you're having your students do is a good, is a really important point to pick up because um, one of the reasons I, because I can do disease modeling in R as well, you know, like that's not hard to do, um, but my students have zero familiarity with R and um, NetLogo is much easier to code in, um, so I do that and the students really love the visuals. Yeah, I have the same experience. Yeah. I, I'm going to use next logo. I've mostly because of the ease of coding. Uh, my students are not they do not have practical practically any experience coding. Some of them have used R, 
but they mostly just run scripts to get the analysis. And then they, uh, I've chosen that logo because of that. It's very high level. When I show that you ask the turtle to do something, they need to understand what's, going, what's happening. And whenever I show them the logic of Volterra model with the equations, they look at me like it's in Greek. And then I show the Nat logo wolf predation model and oh, that's what's happening in this equation. So I've also used uh, ABMs to explain what's happening in mathematical models. It's, I find it to be a very didactic uh, tool. I find it to be very didactic to show what's happening in with programming and it, for the kind of questions that I usually do research on uh, animal behavior and ecology and to think about the agent to think about the animals in terms of agents and to model their behavior is much more intuitive than converting it to an equation and to think up in terms of fitness and stuff like that. Those things actually emerge later in the process and in a much more natural way. So we have a population of animals that do this, this and this and the reproductive consequences are that. I think for the kind of questions I do, it flows much better than with equations and stuff like that. Do you ever have them doing um, empirical lab bench research and then comparing it to um, things that they're doing in NetLogo or having them go out and look at animal, analyze animal behavior around them and then bring it back into the computational arena? Not in classes, but we are doing something like that now with uh, one collaborator that's doing the practical part and I'm doing the coding part of the research. And we are going to try to test some hypotheses like that. I was just curious, that made me think of um, Holly Gaff has done tick research, and so she's written some programs in NetLogo as well, based on her field research. And so I was just curious. So. Uh, what I usually do um, in the classes that I've taught NetLogo is to have them come with their research questions and build models based on the questions, not necessarily comparing data but they build their own model based on the system that they are studying. I think that also makes them feel like they own the model. Right. Yeah, it makes them more linked to the model and I think they learn better that way. So, um, I don't know if everyone else has access to the um, notes folder, but I'm trying to put collect a little bit of some of the resources. Um, Rachel, what do you use? How do you use ABM and NetLogo in your courses? Yeah, well, I'm, I, I don't typically, I'm gonna design a course. I, I use it a lot in my research, um, but I don't have experience teaching it. Um, I'd like to teach a, a course that introduces students to agent-based modeling. Uh, it'll use NetLogo exclusively. Um, these students, they, they won't have a lot of programming background so um, I'd, I'd have to come up with some resources that, that teach them really from scratch how, how to start this. Um, and I, I have done this before with my researchers and I typically use Steve's book. Uh, so I don't have other resources that are my go-to, but I would like students to, at the end of the course, to feel comfortable building the model, um, validating and verifying the model, uh, using behavior space, uh, and then ultimately doing a course project that, that meets their interests. I'm, I'm not exclusively looking at biology or ecology, um, but just doing some course project that they're really interested in with HM based modeling. So are you strictly, is it a math course then or is that? No, I mean, so the idea is to be something different. Um, it's, it's really meant to broaden students' perspective. So while math students could take it, it's for other science students who are just interested in an introduction to modeling, but not really, um, 
there's no prerequisite that they would have to have like calculus. So I'm not interested in differential equation modeling or other types of modeling. I'm just going to try to be specific with agent-based modeling. Um, so in terms of just thinking of what would be most useful, I mean, I think we've got a lot out there. It also depends on, so it sounds like Rachel's class, they're going to be working with it the whole time. I remember Alita was talking about how she was a little bit more like very short exposures. And so um, I think dividing the resources into something like examples of how people do research with it, examples of how people teach with it, and then also thinking about like, if you're going to do just a simple pedagogical approach, like no coding, things like that, like don't introduce them, just don't show them the code tab. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, and then show them maybe, maybe working more in the behavior space idea. So tailoring, um, resources that way. Um, the resources that I shared was just an example of how I, I use the wolf model um, just to show them and working through kind of the tutorials, but more specific to the biological examples and things like that. Um, and it still doesn't go through all of the things that you can do with it, but I, I only have um, like four, I only do two class periods of like background before they have to like go and start creating things. Um, so I don't have as much time. Um, I was curious if what people have used already to introduce beyond Steve's book. So I've used Steve's book as um, the framework and then I have them working through materials, um, which is super fun when you have a class of 20 and you're trying to debug all their code. Um, <laughs> so any suggestions people have for that would be good. Has anybody done that? <laughs> I have. I have them debug each other's code, actually. They trade yeah. the models and try to see why the code works or why it doesn't work. Because debugging that logo is not very good. It's not very easy thing to do. No. Compared to other languages. <laughs> Especially but, when they're staring at you waiting for the answer. <laughs> yeah, and if you have them trade the code with each other, it, uh, the class flows better, the lessons go faster, and mm -hmm. the, it doesn't become very boring. Or maybe yeah. have them repeat, uh, replicate uh, simple models. Right, so I posted, are... yeah, I posted one example where I thought about having them do that, and I think, I think for my class, I just need to give them more time, because when they get to the end, it's like a mad crunch to finish their code and produce something before they have their presentations. But I would like to have that kind of time where they're exchanging because it, it also encourages more creativity because you know you have the group over here that's got 17 different intermediate hosts and the group over here that's got one. And so if they trade, you know, they might somehow end up in the middle of a normal, like reasonable um, system. Um, so when so, you teach, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, I want to let you finish first. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I was gonna say, um, so for this, the the case where I use uh, agent-based models in my class, you know, it's kind of like one of the last, like we build for a few weeks up to that point, um, probably like four or five weeks of Python use before we get to that point. And so, you know, what I what I do is I kind of like step without really telling them their stepwise building skills that they'll need to be able to do that effectively. So. You know, that's part of, I think, um, the strategy. But the other thing that I do in teaching debugging and programming is always hard because they don't understand what any language is and how to deal with things that don't work. Um, we spend a lot of time on trying to do metacognitive work in the class. And so I, have any of you guys gone through like the reading apprenticeship training? Have you ever heard of it? It's this program. I don't know, on my campus, they like it a lot. So they promote it a lot. And it's got some, it's got some good parts of it, some other parts I don't really uh, use all that much. Um, but there are some techniques in it. But the whole general concept is just like you're teaching your students how to think about thinking, right? So um, what we do is we do a lot of sharing of different strategies of how students have approached. So we take, instead of just solving their problem and letting them go along the, on their own thing, uh, we actually, I take time out of class and we sit there and we talk about all the different ways that 
different groups have solved a specific problem. Um, so they can start to see how each other are doing it. Also, I'll have them work in pairs on specific problems so that they're forced to interact with somebody else and see how somebody else is thinking and then share that back out. Um, but there are a bunch of other methods um, that, that you can do, like these, these think out loud strategies where like while, the, while they're trying to program, the person who's doing it will just sort of like say everything that they're thinking. <laughs> like like what they're doing like this is why I'm doing this and this is why I'm doing this and then they're just talking about what they're doing and uh, some of them I find more successful than others but I do think that they 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 are helpful in sort of increasing um, students like uh, a range of creative ways of solving problems I've done something similar when I was teaching R where I've had them comment every single line of code, describing what that line is doing. Yeah. I, I'm planning on doing that on NetLogo also. I think. That's, yeah, that's how I start them with even NetLogo, is just having them yeah. go through a program that doesn't have annotation, just say, tell me what is happening with each one of these. Yeah. What, what does this mean? Why are you using it? Um, and so I, I have them kind of learning from that from two different ways to enter in. One, having them analyze somebody else's code, but then also giving them some of the building blocks. And so when they go through their final projects, I have some groups that start with nothing and build it all. And then some groups who will go and pull different aspects from different um, codes that are already, some models that are already available um, for parasite systems, and then they'll modify from there. And I was like, that's fine, because my goal is not necessarily perfect coding. Um, but I would like them to get more out of it than just coding is hard and it's too specific, which is usually what I get a lot of. Um, what but, size of classes do you teach? Uh, so this is for a parasitology class. Um, I also teach, so my goal for this semester is uh, my evolution class. Uh, no, the uh, size. The number what of size? Um, yeah. 25 to 30, so it's not huge. Um, it's not... Uh, it's manageable. So my evolution class right now is like 25. So okay. uh, it's not, and I do have them work in pairs. So I don't, I don't let them work by themselves with coding. Mm -hmm. They definitely are monitoring the trading off and things like that. Um, I think are good for sure. Um, so I was just thinking that one of the additional resources that might be good is how to facilitate computational thinking. So building on kind of what Nathaniel was talking about is just um, almost like before jumping into coding, you know, resources on just saying like, here's, here's how you think about it. Uh, or at least not even just resources, but recommending that maybe that's the approach instead of having them just going to play with it. Um, so, yeah. Um, I need to think of what else we had talked about. Um, is our goal to come up with a final product today or a decision or maybe just, um, I'm looking to our fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't think we can expect to come up with those. I was hoping we could, you know, try to refine what we want and then put some more work into collecting materials or, um, and, and as you said before, I was expecting there to be more focus on short-term exposures to that logo where, you, um, where you're really looking for how do I show people just enough really quick. And maybe it's just that those people uh, aren't available right now. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you got me. I'm, yeah. I'm a short exposure, but because my evolution course is actually a shorter exposure plan than in my parasitology class, it's set up the same way, but their final project is really based on modeling versus evolution. I want them to be able to use it to answer questions maybe about animal behavior because we've got a section on animal behavior. We've got, you know, right now we're doing selection and drift and all of those. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so for this class, I want it to be a short exposure and I'm trying to tease out how much I want them to know about the coding. Mm -hmm and how much I just really want to focus on the behavior space. Yeah, yeah. And one thing I'm realizing today is that um, 
you know, this topic is really tied to the second topic. If we want to put together modules where we introduce a model and teach them something about, use it as an example to learn something about modeling and a, maybe a particular system, parasites or whatever, then um, that really, how we do that is a big factor in how much that load we mm have -hmm. to teach them. So, and, um, uh, it's my impression that there's more work to be done on that second topic because, um, you know, there are these example models, uh, the models library and stuff like that, but I don't know of a, I, from writing the book, I know it's hard to put together a good example and lead people through it and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, if we could make them headway on that. I think that's probably more important than this topic and, and highly related. So, um, I mean, I've used Gamic. I posted that, a link to that. Um, I've, I haven't used it as effectively as I would like. Uh, here's a link to the paper, but it is a pedagogical approach to mm -hmm. teaching this. Um, and they and all the code is available so you can have the students and so what I had them do is kind of work through it and see if they could recreate it mm -hmm. um, but I haven't found a ton of really great like here's how you have the students build a model from the teaching perspective I found lots of examples of um, using NetLogo to do research and things like that um, but I, and I've also found like the, the very hardcore math agent-based modeling bits but the, the area where I'm existing is really just, I want my students to appreciate modeling. We have a data science minor. And so, um, hey, this, this meeting has been upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> it's like three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm definitely looking for smaller teaching approaches. Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm, like, I'm like that dog and up squirrel. <laughs> So, um, so, yeah, I think that there are other examples. And I'm wondering if there's other examples actually in um, literature, maybe in high school teaching approaches or middle school, because wasn't that logo initially developed for middle school or something like that? Yeah, it was originally designed to teach even elementary school kids, um, you know, this basic idea that complex things can result when you give simple individual or individual simple rules um at the at the university level i guess one thing that maybe we'll talk about next meeting is that um i i think it's important when we do this to introduce why we use agent based models instead of math models which is you know to get at things is like adaptive behavior and variation among the individuals and and show why that stuff's important i i like vitor's uh practice when he does use the wolf sheep predation model of showing people how it's really just a differential equation model um and um so that's a that's a subject that uh, I'll be interested in when we move on to the next topic is is when we pull out these example models and work with them uh, to what extent can we make them really illustrate why we use agent based models instead of math models yeah I, I'd have to say Steve that that's that's probably um, that's something that, I, that I'm really interested in as well. So the, like one of the examples I do is we do an example where they do an agent based model and then they do like Lotka Volterra at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, 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 they kind of model um, what Lotka Volterra, they have to figure out how to, how to make an agent based model do what Lotka Volterra does. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, but in that we have a discussion, we don't dig too deep into it because of time. You know, we only have so much time, but um, we do try to take that as a way of comparing, like, well, what is this lock of a terror model? Is this a real, reliable model? And, of course, you know, it's kind of like a toy model um, when you get right down to it. So then we can say, well, what's the benefits of using these agent-based models and, and those sorts of approaches? And so actually what I'm looking for 
Because I'd really like to find more examples like that. Because the problem is, I think that that example works okay, but I, I have to make more than one set of assignments. Otherwise, every time I teach the class, you know, <laughs> the students already know what the answer is. <laughs> um, so uh, I, uh, I've got a couple that I've kind of like created, but you know, I can't say that they're all as well worked out as some, as some of them. Like, there's one with like population genetics where I've, I've given them genotypes and you know, it's pretty complicated. I could probably do a better one than that. So, um, so I was gonna say the SAR model does it, you know, the network, the disease network models also, I think are really fun to have them play with to thinking about like how their behavior can interact, you know, like, oh, did I wash my hands? Did I not wash my hands? You know what I mean? Like having them play with those models because SAR is another one that can be very static mathematically, but then when you use agent-based modeling and you realize that interaction actually matters and that it can vary, um, I think that that's another fun one to play with. Yeah, I actually have a great, yeah, it's really a great, like a Python model for SEIR. I think it's one for Ebola, the other is for something maybe a predator prey, actually you can drag all the parameters and then the graph will show dynamically. So if anybody interested, I can share with that. And then they can compare with the agent-based modeling, you know, see the powerful things between the two. And maybe agent-based modeling can give us more insight. So they will appreciate that. That's awesome. That would be great. I would love to see that. Yeah, that might be a good one for the next session when we're gonna share uh, like if people want, I mean, I, I think we, I don't know if we're moving farther away from the resource discussion, um, but uh, I think I'm, I'm helping organize that next, the one on October 11th, although I have to talk to Steve about that because I might have okay. to okay. Um, But uh, that would also, that seems like that we all have some examples, so maybe we can, um, if you want to, if you want, we can, uh, just maybe uh, you can, you know, I'll put my email. I don't know if you guys have my email, in there, but if you want to send me any, so I'm going to put it in the chat so you can see it there. Um, but if you wanted to send me stuff, I can start compiling some of those things. So if we're talking about resources too, maybe like we want to have examples of resources that are net logo specific and other ones that are sort of more, of more on the end of what Steve was talking about, but it's like more on the teaching agent-based modeling components. Yeah. And so, Steve, we can put those in a collections too if you wanted to do something like that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll um, we'll get something set up, and I'll I'll make sure everybody knows about it. And because um, then we can then people don't have to email; uh, they can just put it in. Um, yeah, I like it. So yeah, you know, I'll I'll try to do a little bit more to um because we'll have we have a little more time before then next meeting and. Uh, to send out information on, on what we're gonna, what kind of stuff we're trying to round up and what questions we want to address. That's good. Um, in terms of, I guess I just have a logistical question which ties into the resources. In terms of products, um, is it things that we find interesting in our class or is it driven, are the products driven by our groups? What is the preference for, because I know like I'm, I'm going to implement this in my class and you're not all teaching my class. And so I'm curious <laughs> how those are going to connect or is it just, you know, if we can come up with a common intro idea or something like that. Do you have an idea of what you would prefer or is this just organic and we're going to see where it goes. Is this to everyone or to I'm just curious. Yeah, I can't help with that because I'm not the, the consumer here, so. Uh, I am a consumer, but. Um. Well, I guess I would, if, if I was thinking about my needs, um, I would like, or at least for a whole course in NetLogo to see a, a syllabus laying out what topics I wanna teach when and how much time I would spend on them. Now that might not be useful to all of you who are implementing it as a short project in a course, but can we come up with a list of learning objectives for that, that short time period that you have, like some, some goals that you have in teaching? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. 
I definitely have learning objectives in my head, but I don't know that I've ever shared them with my students. <laughs> Maybe yeah, I, I would say like having, I tend to find that the, the that um, when I talk to other faculty and trying to share with them things that I do, understanding the learning objectives, the specific things that um, I'm doing to try to accomplish those objectives. So what are the exercises or the examples? Um, and also I think what Rachel said, like the time, the timing aspect is real, right? Especially it's one thing if you're doing a whole class, it's another thing if you're doing it as part of a class and you already have all your existing content to work in. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is we have, um, a, a Keck foundation grant where we're trying to integrate genomics and bioinformatics oriented activities into you know, like uh, course-based research activities into classes across our biology curriculum because they can be applied to all different kinds of fields like we can do eDNA and ecology and we can do genome assembly and bioinformatics whatever it is right and um but one of the challenges is right is like everybody's already got their class that they teach with all the things they normally teach in it and people don't necessarily think that the things they're teaching are not important so how do we find a way for us to integrate this kind of thing into an existing class structure. So those timing components, I think are, you know, and maybe presenting a couple exemplars that are both, you know, like the whole course, half the course, you know, are, are a big, like a project-based part of the course, and then maybe a little short component as, you know, this is, if you're gonna do this for a week or two, this is what you would do. If you're gonna do this for three to four weeks, this is what you might do. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the aspects of, you know, the trying to get the content all in, and then the desire to introduce students to modeling and the importance of it in biology, I think, you know, finding that way to shoehorn it in and maybe giving examples of everyone covers this kind of topic in bio, right? And here's a way to not, you can cover both the content and these new skills at the same time so that you're not having to compromise content time. You know what I mean? Finding finding it, it as a replacement rather than an, a supplementation. And so usually these activities appear or feel like supplementation rather than a replacement activity of what you're already doing. If it's a replacement, then you're not losing any time. Then there's a no brainer to include it other than activation energy to actually teach yourself it, to teach it, right? Versus if it's, oh, here, this is cool. You can teach this in addition to how you already teach genetic drift. That's not ideal. Um, and just as a heads up, I have to leave. I have to teach at 125, so I do have to leave early. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah, I was going to ask whether or not uh, you felt like we had kind of covered things. I, I was just writing down a list of uh, questions, objectives, and stuff for our next meeting that I'll send out as soon as I can so we can get thinking on it uh, as soon as we can. Sounds good. I mean, I think that we've got more questions than answers, but... Um. <laughs> so, so just from taking notes, one thing I'll say is it looks like that there, there are a couple things we could think, it, it did seem like people were um, interested in the idea of uh, uh, categorizing resources. I think that, that seems like a good idea to categorize resources into different types. Um, there were distinct breaks and sort of like things related just to training in that logo versus uh, 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 resources related to just uh, agent-based modeling in general versus uh, teaching and research, research being two separate uh, example, examples. And then it did seem pretty clear that um, people thought that the idea of creating um, exemplars for that, that hit specific outcomes that people may already be using would be a good thing to do. Um, and that if we could associate those exemplars with learning outcomes and specific exercises, um, that, that would be a, might be a powerful model to put forth. So those, from looking at the notes and listening, yeah, it seems like those were some um, organizing things that we can maybe take from this meeting and, and maybe work towards.
Sound months. good? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this can be a continuing prog uh, process, but I think if there were people that were interested in sharing at least their exemplars and or a wish list, right? If there's a yeah. wish list of, of systems that you're like, I really want to teach with this model, I really think it'd be a good example because of this, you know, we can form groups on based on that. All right, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Is there a specific way you'd like me to wrap it up? <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I think if we can start compiling, and um, I guess you can email me with a, I can post on the forum, send me a wish list, and we can start compiling a list of um, resources that people are interested in working on or have already worked on and just want to adapt. Um, the resources and things like that. Um, one of the things that you can do on Cubes is you can post adaptations to resources. So like my stuff that I send out, those are absolutely adaptations on the tutorials that are on NetLogo. They're not, you know what I mean? Like I used their materials to start with, but you can do that on Cubes. You can post the original resource and then you can post adaptations underneath so then people can see how you use them. That's, okay. It's also a way of doing things. So if you want, I can start compiling the list and see where we go from there. Okay. Yeah. I, can I ask you one question? I mean, I'm not as I'm still not really familiar with how the cubes website works. So those adaptations, would they be posted? Uh, like, are we trying to build a, you mentioned building a collection. Is that the goal here is to build a collection? Making sure, I'm just trying to get, make sure I get. Oh yeah, right. that's okay. And I know like what heading to go to. Yeah, no. So the collections, there are collections within our group alone was what I was referring to just, and that's just places that our group can see on our own website, on our own cube site, so that we can say like, oh, hey, here's here are a bunch of resources that I found on teaching X, Y, and Z, or on this ABM model that I'm interested in. Um, it's just a place to put stuff in other than the forum. The forum kind of, everyone gets notifications all the time. The collections is just a place where everyone can go back to and be like, I don't have to refine the email. All of the stuff is in that spot. Um, but in terms of posting on cubes, um, there are different ways to do it. Um, I can show you an example of uh, one way that we can do it. Um, I have to find my groups. Um, and so you can post adaptations. I need to go to my dashboard. I need to get to. Um, and so there are different ways to post. And so the collections I was talking about was just um, uh, using using our own page. Um, this is an example where we can post. So that's the general website, and then this is where you can post. Can, can you share your screen with us? I, we can't see what you're seeing. You're seeing. Ah, thank. You. Oh, something just happened. Frozen. Sorry, I froze. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share your screen with us? Because we can't see what you're doing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was posting the websites in the chat. I should have been more. Oh, OK. I see. Why I was doing that. My computer is being really weird. Um, and so that is a website that you can go to. Um, here we go. And so what you can see, the second one I just posted is a link to just a whole bunch of resources that were posted from one of our previous faculty mentoring networks, actually two of them. And so um, the ones at the top are all, they've been published both on CUBES, but also on in Teaching Issues and Experiments in Ecology, which is um, an online journal. But if you scroll down to module adaptations, um, there's some that are actually just adaptations. So the original resource is posted on CUBES, and then there's an adaptation underneath it. And so people can see kind of how those have been changed. That makes sense? Mm, okay. So that's just one example of how things are posted on cubes that we can do. We can do something like that. Um, yeah. 
but I have to teach in ten. I have to teach in nine minutes, and I have to run across campus, um, and I'm giving them an exam. And they're my nursing students, so they might lose their mind if I'm late. Um, so I will see you guys next week. Uh, I'm sorry to run. No, that's okay. Oh. Thank you for uh, facilitating. And, <laughs> oh. uh, all right, I will um, post the recording. I will send out an announcement about. I think the next meeting might be a little more structured. I have a whole list of specific things I would like us to, like different kinds of example models, um, and maybe different people can work on on, on trying to uh, identify identify or evaluate. Uh, examples. Um, so I'll try to get that going soon. Um, all right, very good. Thank you all. So, so Steve, yeah. can I ask you a question about that before you take off? So the next meeting is that's the October 11th meeting, is that right? Uh, two weeks from today, that sounds right, yeah. Um, so is that the uh, I had mentioned that I would I could help with the next meeting. Am I the only person listed on that right now? Um, I don't I think, think so I am. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. I just have, so my, I realized that I have a slight conflict on that day. So, um, I may, I am actually going to the, the, the Nibbles meeting, which is also part of Cubes, which is like a bioinformatics ethics uh, focus group. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to be at that workshop in Nebraska on that day. Um, okay. I'm going to try to step out during that time, but I'm not sure, I haven't seen the actual agenda yet, so I, I don't know. Um, but I definitely can help with all of the material gathering and all the other components beforehand, but I just, I'm not 100% sure that I'll be there for the entire okay. period of time to help lead discussion. All right, so I want to assign you as a facilitator, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, then, I might be able to do it, I gotta have a look and see like what the, yeah. what I'm supposed to be doing at that time. Okay, I'll um, make a note. That day, I also will be going to Tempe. So if my flight won't get delayed, I think I can Zoom in the hotel if everything, you know, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll do our best. All right, anything else? Huh? Okay, adios. I'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.